Hi everyone, this is Claire um, at Dental Toaster. So thank you for all being here today. Um, I'm gonna choose a virtual background right now just so that you don't have to see um, you know, the, the little that I'm working from right now. So I have uh, a number of people right now. We have Natalie, Elise, Jerry. Um, thank you for being here all. If I don't, you know, spell your name or, or you know, um, talk about you, um, you know, please remind me that you are here. You can use the chat right now. So let's try this right now. Before we re even start the webinar, I just want to make sure that the chat function is working. So if you can put just, um, you know, where you're from in the chat, that would be really helpful. That'll help me understand um, if you can hear me. You can say yes, North uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. We have, who else do we have? You guys can continue on the right chat. Here. Thank you. And while we do that, right can I ask everybody to mute Good yourself? Hi, Lynn. <laughs> That's okay. I'm going to mute everybody as well. Uh, please uh, mute yourself. So we have everybody, Mountain of Colorado, that's wonderful, South Jersey, Rome, Georgia, Indiana. Um, we have Maryland as well, Massachusetts, Saskatoon, that's Canada. Wow, that is amazing. Okay, we have Texas, New Jersey, Illinois, California. Wow, everybody's from everywhere. That is wonderful. It's always nice to see, you know, that uh, the online world allowed us to be connected as well, right? Um, so if that's okay with you, I would love to ask you guys, um, you know, how you are doing. I know this is a very difficult time for everybody. I just want to make sure that I understand that you are all safe, yeah, um, that you all are okay uh -huh. with your family as well. I can't um, hear her. Any Anybody um, here mm -hmm. have children? Anybody have children over here? Yeah, there are you. No. Yes, yes. Okay. So, how are you all doing with your children as well? Oh, I'm good. All right. So, um, if that's okay with you guys, if you can mute One yourself, mm -hmm. that's the bottom left button. If you can do that, that'll be awesome. So we can have clear audio for everybody. I'm just gonna wait for that before we start our webinar. It's exactly three o'clock East Coast time. Some of you on, on different time zones as well. Thank you all for being here. Great. So uh, Megan, you have two kids, age three and one. Whoo, how's that at home? Right. Um, anybody who has children that you also have to homeschool now, just because that's that's the way it is. Um, you know, I'm hearing from from friends who have children um, that you know it's, it's been extremely challenging trying to work online sometimes, trying to um, take phone calls and and trying to take care of them, it, and it's hard to get out as well. Right. You can't really um, go to the park like you used to. So probably is pretty difficult. Great. So um, today, you know, it's going to be about the virus, right? I mean, there's nobody on earth, I think probably that, you know, I mean, there's some people, yes, but nobody really on earth that doesn't really know what's going on right now. I think it's really not just here, North America, in Asia, I mean, other continent, in Africa as well, um, in Europe, everybody is affected by this virus that we're going to talk about today. But really, the, the big a big picture over here is to have everybody understand more about virus in general, not just the virus we have right now, because this is just a critical time to understand how it works. And that helps us understand how that is relevant for us as dental professionals. Because at the end of the day, if we understand that, we will be able to protect ourselves better. We will be able to explain that better to the patient as well. Because when we, you go back, I bet there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be asking you questions as also a healthcare professional about, you know, what is this virus? Am I going to get infected? Are you going to give it to me, for example, you know? So I hope we are a little bit better um, uh, today by learning about the virus in general. Now, why did I come up with this idea to do um, a special webinar about viruses? Well, I did it last week already, um, and I had about 300 people sign up for that. Then I realized, wow, you know, we need to spread the word more. So that's why I relaunched it. I made changes. So it's even better. Last time it was one hour. This time it's two hours. So we're going to talk about many different things. 
Um, Amy, you're saying some people have their camera on. Uh, <laughs> So uh, she's saying, I hope you're not going to all take us to the bathroom as well, like that lady that went viral. Um, you know, I appreciate if you have your camera on. If you don't, that is great as well. But yeah, make sure that you mute yourself if, if you need to go somewhere or um, if you are going to the restroom, feel free, go stretch your legs as well. I'm a big also believer in being able to stretch during the um, course as well. You don't have to be sitting. You know, I encourage all my students anyways to just keep moving around because our brain, there are two things our brain like is oxygen and glucose. So if we find a way to give our brain continuous oxygen, that's by being active and glucose, which is by eating, you know, your normal diet is fine. You know, your brain is going to be happier. So I'm just trying to say that um, don't be afraid to walk around. Now. I'm going to start. My name is Claire. I am the founder of Student RDH, which is the Dental Hygiene Boards Review. I don't know if some of you have taken that to become a dental hygienist. Every year I help about um, 3,000 students and um, in North America, US and Canada pass their board examinations. Um, you know, it's not really about me or student RDH right now at all. This is um, a series that I actually started for the students for the schools because all the schools are online now. Imagine that you had your dental hygiene school online. Would you like that or not? You can use the chat to to tell me, but the, the big, big problem here is didactic, okay, to a certain degree is okay, but then clinical, how are you gonna learn clinical online? So it's, it's a big problem now. Professors are just freaking out because everything needs to shift. So I, that's why I'm stepping in a lot in the school saying, hey, you know, those are the things that I can do. So we're gonna do a little bit more textbook style versus, you know, your normal continuing education. I do provide a ton of continuing education as well for um, our dental professionals. And that includes, you know, many different things. Um, Sometimes I talk about Alzheimer and periodontal disease, so and or pathology, but this time we are just going to focus about the virus. I would like to quickly ask you, all of you, how confident do you feel about the virus or you know virus in general or microbiology or immunology? You can put on the uh, scale one to ten how you feel about that. Uh, we have some seven, we have some six. Okay, eight. Okay, great, great, great. Okay. So everybody is saying something a little different. Yes, five out of 10, five-ish, seven, eight. Okay, a number of different things. Perfect. Well, six-ish. Okay, good. I'm just trying to quickly gauge everybody here to understand, um, you know, how we have to present, although I have it ready already. Good. A lot of you feel above five at least, which is good. Okay. So in dental hygiene, we already started this, right? Microbiology and immunology. Tell me how you felt about that when you were studying. Did you feel like, you know, at school, everything was great that you understood everything or did you kind of feel like, mm, maybe, you know, I, I have to really review that. So immunology and, um, and, you know, or pathology, or we're going to talk about a little bit of pathology as well. But, you know, and Rebecca is saying microbiology was tough for me because um, it's not her favorite. Uh, Baron said that was a long time ago. Elizabeth saying, oh, you actually loved it and you studied a lot. And Diana also loved it. So, um, you know, the, the thing about microbiology is like it's so small, right? I mean, how small of a scale are we talking about microbiology? You know, to a certain degree, we don't even see it. And you know what? The microscope, you can't even see it with the microscope. So that's how you know that it is extremely, extremely small. So for us to really think about that, to relate to that is very, very difficult, right? So just like when you when we talk about the galaxy, like we don't really see the galaxy per se, right? That's why it is very difficult for us, for anybody, you know, to really, um, you know, have a, have a good understanding of that. 
So we're going to um, look at all of those together today. Now, I'm going to start with, um, you know, some definitions. So let me show you how we're going to structure the class, and then I'll be able to tell you how we are going to continue with the class. I prepared a few questions, and we'll be able to, um, to answer those together as well. Now, uh, some of the objectives that I, I have for us, and let me start kind of sharing the screen over here. Um, give me one moment, please. So I'm going to share my screen through my iPad, actually. Uh, let me undo this so you can see what's going on. Um, choose virtual background, none. Okay. So guys, what I'm trying to show you is that I'm going to roll our presentation through my iPad. And I have a pen, and hopefully this whole thing works, and I'll be able to draw you some concept and things like that, because um, that's what I do a lot. And what... I might not be exactly looking at the camera just because I'm looking at the iPad. So I'm going to use my computer to be the camera for me. And I'm going to use this one in order to draw you things. So um, if that's okay with you, we are going to try that together. And I just want to tell you that I appreciate all you've be here and be um, honest with me as well. If you do not understand something, feel free to let me uh, know as well. Now, the only thing is that this PowerPoint is starting on my iPad. Um, so let's give it just a, a, a few uh, seconds and then we'll be able to uh, really start with that. Okay, so, um, you know, this iPad, I'm going to restart it because it was just not performing perfectly. I'm going to share with you my screen via my computer for now, and then we'll be able to talk about the objectives first. Now, while I do that, I would love everybody to tell me how you feel, um, you know, about generally the coronavirus. I'm going to just start with this joke that is going around just on the internet. It has really nothing to do with, um, you know, the, the, the actual coronavirus, which is in the beginning, I don't know if you remember, but people were saying, oh, like the coronavirus, the, the sales of corona is actually dropping. Did you guys hear that before? Um, so I just had this, you know, funny thing that came from literally the internet. Um, it's not my intention to, to uh, you know, make fun of it. Um, it's actually spelled wrong anyways. Um, so I just wanted to just share this joke with you, start with this one. And as you can see, I can um, see you over here, guys. So I'm just going to continue uh, flipping some things over here so I can see the group chat as well. Now, you know, this is, um, this is my name, Claire, and last name, Chong. I have a master's degree and I'm also an RDH. So the objectives over here today is really to understand the difference between a bacteria and a virus because I think a lot of confusion is okay infection disease doesn't mean bacteria or virus infection disease can be anything but how you know it is evolving who it is affecting how it is affecting people how uh, the bacteria or virus replicate are completely different stories they're completely different species Therefore, we need to uh, make sure that we don't confuse them. So I really want to address the, um, you know, theory about bacteria versus viruses. And I also, I want to explain how viruses replicate. And then we need to fully understand the chain of infection as well. So, uh, you know, there, there's this famous uh, circle, but instead I'm just going to kind of focus today on like the modes of transmission, because I think that's the one that, uh, that a lot of people are uh, wondering about right now. What is happening? How can we get the virus? Um, is it through air? You know, is it through coughing and things like that? And then we have... Um, teaching the mechanism of soap and hand washing. So I want to just go over by dissecting what the virus is, is what hand soap, you know, and hand washing can do. Because a lot of people out there are using um, hand sanitizers, right? Anybody over here like bought some like Purell or, you know, some, some other things just to uh, make sure that you have enough? 
right? Um, especially, I think if you they, people are not in the dental community or in the medical community, they think that is the golden answer, right? And we know by being a dental hygienist or being a dental professional that hand washing is a critical component. Now, tell me in the chat, when you were in school, did they grade you on hand washing? Did your instructor look at you and said how many um, seconds you have to wash your hands and, and were graded on that, right? Yes. Okay. A lot of yeses are coming in, right? And I, and oh my God, when I first did that, I, hmm, I really didn't understand why, you know, I thought, oh, okay, they really just want to make our life difficult right now. That's why they are doing this to us. However, we have to understand that it's really not because of that. It's really because, um, you know, we it, now you understand, like, there's a reason why. There, there's a reason. So we're going to understand that. And you're right. Probably the first grades when you, that you start, you know, that's like one of the first thing you ever do. Now, we're also going to talk about... Um, the famous viruses that changed the world, okay? We can't talk about everything else just because there are just so many of them. But I wanna just clarify, um, you know, a few things that changed the world and that's gonna be kind of an expansion because I'm doing a series of just all the different viruses as well. And then I also want to understand with you um, how to differentiate the different types of immunity because, you know, we're waiting for a vaccine, right? And I want everybody to participate with me in the chat right now. How long do you think it's going to take for us to find a vaccine? 18 months, Christine, Amy, okay. Okay, we have 12 to 18 months, okay. Those are all great answers. One year plus six. I'm assuming, Jerry, you're saying six months, right? Yep, eight months, at least a year. Okay, we have a number of things that are going on over here. And, um, you know, I would like to just put a disclaimer that I am not a viral, you know, specialist, right? I'm not someone who just lives on studying the viruses or, or even the bacteria. But, you know, I did a lot of extremely lots of research to be able to also teach at the schools um, and to teach over here as well. So we're gonna learn um, how immunity forms and what the vaccines can do. Now, uh, the recent research about, you know, it's okay, there's this company called Moderna. I don't know if you heard that um, over uh, the news, but they, you know, they are st starting really soon already um, trying to, this injection that they created to put it on people. The reason why they can do that is because actually this thing resembles a lot what we have experienced before. Okay, so we're going to talk about that as well. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing the screen. I'm going to just jump into my iPad because it is soon ready now. Okay. Okay. And while I do that, if you can just share with me on this, the, the chat, what is the state of your state? I'm saying like, is the lockdown until, until a certain time? I'm just trying to understand, wrap my head around how um, you know all the schools can also potentially be affected because not every um, state follows the same protocol right now. So we have stay at home and, until um, 4.30, okay, April 30th. Okay, perfect. Okay. Unfortunately, New York, no lockdown, only strong recommendation. Ah, uh, Lise, okay. Those are one of the things that I don't really understand about New York right now. And you probably do as well. Mm 
Okay. South Dakota, it seems like. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody, for participating. And I agree, we should have implemented this a lot earlier just so that we can, um, you know, follow the, you know, uh, anyways, you know, I'm not going to go into politics right now. Um, I just want to make sure that we all understand what's going on. So you have my screen now, and I'm going to just walk through the presentation with you. Okay, here it was. So here we have the joke. Okay, we already talked about this. Let me see if I can. Okay, so donations are going to go to um, twice as nice uniforms that I said um, in the description as well. Um, you know, Debbie, who's a good friend as well, is doing a lot of great things for the dental community. Now let's start with what's a virus, like really the definitions of it. And uh, my screen is breaking a little bit, so please stay with me. I think it's just a glitch with Zoom. But here, I just want to help you, help you understand what's going on here. So as you can see, there's a virus on the left, and there is a um, bacteria on the right side. Now. On the left side, you see the virus. It is much more simple than the one on the right side, right? The virus is literally composed of the outer layer that is really the, um, they call it the capsid, okay? The outside layer over here. And then the um, inside is about the RNA and the DNA. So it's really more like a package and some information inside, right? Not much going on, right? So let's continue with the bacteria. How is it so different? The main difference here is that the bacteria, as you can see, has everything, has chromosome, has, you know, this thing called um, the pilus, the plasma membrane, the cytoplasm and everything. So that really shows you that this is a, a living thing. This is a animal of its own. That's the difference. And RNA is literally just a package with some information. So you can think about, you know, an Amazon box that you would receive with a textbook or a manual inside how to build your cabinet, for example. So that is the bacteria versus um, virus. I think we understand the composition of that, right? So let's see if we can go to the next slide. So here, if you can see, the, how do they discover virus though? That was a mystery to me. And I really wanted to share um, the mechanism of how they um, discovered this. So in 1892, the scientist, he said, there's something that's causing this tobacco leaf to die. There's something here, but there was no bug. He couldn't see anything. So what I did is literally this. So let's think about this as a filter and think about this as a, as a cup. So he poured water that he infused with the leaf over here, okay? And he let it filter through this very, very um, elaborate filter back then in 1892. And he got a bunch of water and he thought, Okay, this thing, I'm gonna inject it back here. And you know, this um, leaf got infected as well. Then he learned, oh, there's something here. There's something that is causing the plant to behave this way. So this is so small, right? Because the filter didn't do it. So that's actually how they first discovered the virus. And around six, about six years afterwards, um, another scientist also discovered it. You know, a lot of times it's actually happening in synchronicity. Uh, a lot of times things happen around different parts of the world at the same time when the time is right. So this is actually how they discovered the virus. 
Now let's look at the structures. Um, the structures are really just um, about four types. So if you have a pen and pencil, feel free to draw this with me. I just want to share with you by just drawing that you can do a lot more. So helical over here really means that it, it is um, a cone shape. So over here, you know, it's a kind of a straight thing. It's kind of the, um, I'm using currently, what do you call this? The, the, not the medicine ball, the, the, the foam roller. It, it looks literally like the foam roller that I am using. Then you have what's called the complex, okay? It's also called the head and tail. The reason why it's called the head and tail, because as you can see, there is a head and there is the tail. Now, um, a lot of people, if you ask them, hey, what does a virus look like? They're going to give you this. They are going to draw you this complex, those, this head and tail form, right? And this is the thing that also appears a lot in our textbook, just because I feel like this is a little bit more catchy. Then we have the envelope type, which is the round one. And then they call this polyhedral, or also you're going to hear this on the news a lot, I icosahedral. So they say this has 20, tri 20 triangles. So we have different structures going on over here. And can you just take a guess among those, which one is the one with the coronavirus? Which shape is related to the coronavirus right now? I have the chat back, chats are chat back. Envelope, we have a lot of envelope. Okay. All right, thank you very much. So perfect, I'm just gonna leave it here. I'm not gonna give the answer right now, but we're gonna talk about it in the section. We are just focusing on the coronavirus, okay? Um, and they are spikes. So, you know, Carol, that, that is also um, correct. Now, let's continue over here. How do they replicate? I mean, what is the process of them multiplying? So let me just draw you a bacteria. Bacteria are awesome as replicating, but just quickly, one turns into two, two turns into four, four turns into eight. Okay, so they keep dividing. They keep multiplying by division. That is the bacteria, and that is extremely, extremely powerful. Like the rate is like crazy. It's so fast. However, the virus is even better at doing that. So let's look at it together. What I have a picture over here is from the CDC. And as you can see over here, there are some spikes. And we had, was that Carly who said there are spikes as well? So that is correct. So those spikes are really kind of the key to enter the human cell. So this is the human cell. This is a receptor. It's called the viral receptor. And this is going to just fit like a key and like in a door and kind of open the entire cell over here. It's gonna give itself a way to enter our human body. So the big difference between the virus versus the bacteria is that the virus must have a host. Now, host lists many different um, categories of hosts, right? There's a human. What else? There's other animals. Any other living things on Earth is a host for them, including plants, including bacteria. What else? including virus. Sometimes they get into themselves. So viruses, sometimes people debate, okay, scientists debate, do we call it a living thing or not? Generally, we say not, but they can actually infect each other as well. So um, that's what we need. A human, a, sorry, oops, a human, animal, plant, a bacteria, or a virus. It needs somewhere. Actually, the virus is not really choosing us to live. It's just spreading as fast as they can. It's just spraying its thing 
and just hopefully land in on some sort of um, host that is going to be good for them. That's not always the human. So let's continue our story over here. There are process of replication. So the first thing, if I may draw my virus over here. Okay, so my virus, I'm just gonna make it like a round thing, okay? So there's a human cell over here. It's gonna attach, as you can see, there was a key, you know, kind of a lock system. And the second phase is that it's going to get inside. After that, what's going to happen is that inside this, you remember they had RNA and DNA? It depends on which type of virus. So I can't say RNA or DNA, it depends. So this is gonna get out, it's gonna get released like that. Okay, basically you're opening the box. And after that, what happened is gonna multiply. You're gonna have just so many of this, okay? And then what it's going to do is, I'm just gonna draw the surface over here it's going to assemble around the surface actually of your own cell. So it's kind of get ready to be packaged again. And then what happens after that, I'm just gonna draw it with a different color on top of that. It's going to start budding out like that. And then out you go. This is the process of replication for the virus. Any questions on this right now? If you are okay right now, we can continue as well. Perfect. Now, transmission though, virus, how does that, how does that get transmitted from us to other humans? That, that's the concern right now, right? And we have Keiko that says bats, right? So I think Keiko is trying to say that it originally came from bats, right? And that is true. It came from bats and you know, there are a lot of other viruses that came from um, animals. That includes the chicken, that includes the pig, um, that includes the chimpanzee in the HIV case. In this case, we have the bat for um, COVID-19. But anyhow, let's see how we are transmitting um, a virus to another human being. That's why we're doing our social distancing, right? So this is literally by the CDC, okay? I didn't make this up because there, I think there's some confusion about what it is to have contact, airborne and droplet, um, how you categorize them. But in contact, basically um, the CDC is dividing this into two categories. One is direct, and indirect. So what do you think direct is in this case? Any idea of what direct could mean? And there's no wrong answer here, just want all of you to participate if possible, um, just to have fun as well. This is a, a fun learning exercise, I think. And um, if you don't feel comfortable, that is totally okay as well. Okay, so we have a lot of great answers over here. Perfect. Okay, so basically direct meaning that, you know, you are getting the thing that people, let's say coughed, directly to you. There's no intermediate. There's no surface that you touch. There is nothing. Basically, it means that um, it directly landed on you. And then indirect, meaning that there's something in between, such as a surface. Okay, so also the CDC gives you two categories, which is airborne and droplet. This is all about aerosol. Okay, aerosol is the big umbrella that calls for airborne and droplets. Airborne, they call when it's like really small. So those are microns, like, you know, micromillers. You can't see really them. But when you sneeze and let's say there's a shadow behind, I think you can see the little droplets, right? So droplets are a little bigger, you can see them. Airborne, um, you can't really see it. Now, the difference also is because droplets um, are heavy 
and they fall to the ground faster. Airborne gets suspended for a longer period of time. Droplets can also get suspended as well. It doesn't immediately fall like a rock to the ground. However, um, you know, it is faster to drop to the floor. So now you have seen the difference between those two. Let's go back to trying to understand what's going on when we have a um, viral infection. So this is, um, I can't really give credit to whoever draw this, but I think it did a good job. So by the CDC though, um, a, a droplets, you know, will drop in about three to five feet. Now, I don't know how tall you are, but I'm about a little taller than five feet foot tall but I this is kind of what I understand you know you need this distance between two people in order to minimize it doesn't mean that this droplets can travel much further than that it actually could however we are just trying to see that um, the best way to protect ourselves is just to create distance but look at this image at the bottom it's a very very important image so Ebola as you can see, you have droplets and they fall to the ground. Okay, about three feet. But the, the CCC can also say, okay, it, it takes 10 feet, okay? But if you see measles, the problem here is that the measles, the measles spray, like it just sprays. That's a problem, right? This is air vent. When it sprays like that, I mean, the, can you imagine the magnitude of this, the spread of what's going on over here? It would, it would be a disaster, right? Luckily, we don't have measles anymore. So that's the good news. However, I just wanted to share this really important point that there's a big difference between airborne and droplet. Now, I wanna ask you guys on the chat, do you know, you know, currently what are we saying about um, the virus we have right now with COVID-19? Is it droplets or is it airborne? I think we are coming more to um, an agreement that this is caused more by droplets. Yes, a lot of you guys are saying droplets. Okay, so in the beginning, there were speculations that it was a lot of, um, sorry, it was um, airborne, which really scared everybody because if it's airborne, it's a huge problem. But now we kind of understood that it is more droplets, which is, I think, in a way, the good news. Let's continue our story with viruses. You know, viruses are harmful. Do you know the Spanish flu, 1918, it killed, can you guess how many people it killed back then? Or how many people it infected? And we're going to learn about the Spanish flu later, but, you know, we can just take a guess right now. So about a hundred years ago, and thank you everybody for participating in the chat. Um, five million, five million, yeah, millions for sure. Okay, thank you, Adriana. And really just to, just to share right now, about one third of the population was infected. Okay, so that's how severe it was. I'm not telling you how many people died because we're gonna discover this in the Spanish flu section together. And then we have COVID, ooh, complete type over here, COVID-19. And then measles, it's harmful. What else is harmful? Polio. What about herpes? We worry about that, you know, as a dental professional, right? What if that lands on my finger, right? And chicken pox as well. And um, HIV. HIV actually killed so many people on earth. So all of those are harmful, but are they all harmful? The answer is no. Sometimes they are really, really, really useful. And actually they stay in our human body. We have, you know, millions of viruses living on around inside us. And like the H, um, PV or herpes virus, they are living inside us. But when we were born as well, they say about 8% of our DNA is virus related. So what happens like viruses kind of gets inside us and us as a human, our DNA, you know, kind of fabricated, molded into it. And then we are growing. We are, are um, sorry, our children are getting that as well. So our genes keep 
going down and with the virus being incorporated in that. So they say about 8% of DNA is actually made of virus. Isn't that crazy? So virus is inside us, is around us. So virus here, I have an image. So in the background is kind of, you can imagine, right? A lake or the sea and it has this green thing. The green thing is actually called the cyanobacteria. And um, it's green, but what it does is provides actually 50% of the earth oxygen because it is going to release this thing called the liquid hydrocarbon into the ocean every year. Now, on this bacteria, there is a virus and we call them the cyanobacteria virus. And it's the green blue algae and it actually has the ability to produce oxygen as well. And they say about 5% of oxygen, you know, in the atmosphere is created by the virus. So virus is not always a bad thing, right? It's bad, only it affects us in certain ways. Now, sometimes it's neutral. Most of the time actually is neutral. So do you guys, you're gonna think about swimming twice now. In the ocean, they're about 10 to the 30th power amount of virus. That's a lot, right? When you swim, you are gonna swallow that, you're gonna have it all over you. There are actually viruses that are just attacking a whales, for example, but it's not really affecting us. So um, SARS, COVID-19, it actually is not affecting dogs. Why, why is that? Because um, virus has just a specific target. So humans may be affected, but dogs might not be affected. So you can have a dog in your home. Don't try to quarantine them. I think they, I mean, they, they would be happier with you around, even if you think you were infected or you had the flu because dogs are not gonna get this one. Dogs might get their own type of disease related to different type of viruses. What about the lettuce mosaic virus? Well, the, as you can see in the background, so there's some darker spots in the lettuce and you might actually have seen this already. I don't know if you garden, but even if I go to the supermarket, sometimes there are spots. Now, those spots, are caught, can be caused by virus. I'm not gonna you know, try to tell you that all, all of the spots you're gonna see are caused by viruses, but sometimes it is. But you know, it doesn't do anything to us. We eat it, we eat this just like salad of, of viruses, and then it's gonna be okay because it's only affecting that plant. So a lot of times viruses are neutral to us. We, we ingest so much of it, we have it covered all around us, but we are not harmed by it. So it's, it's a little bit more rare that we are harmed by those viruses. So I hope you understand all this concept of it can be neutral as well. And actually, we talked about the bat earlier, but you know this, this virus that we're talking about right now originally came from bats. Some come from pigs. So usually they stay within those animals. They don't affect uh, humans. But sometimes there's a spillover, they say, and it comes to the human as well. Now, I wanna quickly show you a clip of this movie that is called The Contagion. Anybody watched this before, actually? Yes, totally watched this this weekend, okay? The other night, okay. So some of you might already know this, Christy, no? Okay, so I'm just gonna show you the very end, which is, I'm just taking you right now to my YouTube. Let's see if it works. Oh, it's gonna play a little, um, sorry, it's gonna play a little clip of ad just because I don't have the uh, expensive version. To fly a rocket ship, you need to be an optimist. No astronaut right, skip launches that, first.
Okay. So as you can see, there is something that did wrong or, or they that actually caused the entire virus to spread. Can you pinpoint that area that was actually the start of the spread of the virus? So in the beginning, there was the bat, right? So the bat dropped a banana, got to the pig, and then the pig was you know, slaughtered to be in the restaurant. But there, what happened? He didn't wash his hands. All right, Rachel. That's why hand washing is so important. And let me just quickly, <laughs> no scrubs, no long scrubs, okay. So let's talk about hand washing for a second over here. And we have the coronavirus section now. Here, I'm gonna draw a virus. And what happens here is that when you wash your hands, you're gonna get soap and water and all of this is gonna start loosening those parts up, the outer part. And if you keep doing this for 20 seconds plus, you're gonna get some chunks out. You're gonna be able to destroy the virus by taking it apart. So that's why hand washing is so important. And that's why 20 seconds is so important. It's not because they wanna just make you sing happy birthday twice. It's because if you just quickly do a little rinse like that with some soap, you're not rubbing it. You're not actually doing enough to scrub the, um, the outside layer of the virus. That's why hand washing is important. And that's the science of hand washing just in you know five seconds. Let's talk about some numbers over here with the coronavirus. So I looked at it yesterday. There was 750 or you know, almost 751 confirmed cases. This is in the world. Um, and there was 36,000 plus death. And the death rate right now is at about 4.7. That's an that's a extremely high number, about 4.7 death rate. Now, the WHO, you know, that's exactly the numbers they had. And if you look at the map over here, you'll be able to see that um, there's some parts of the, the world that are more affected. I mean, North America being one of them, France, we know Spain is very much affected as well. There are some areas, China is a lot less now. So this also was from the WHO. Those are uh, WHO, CDC are where, um, you know, I use a lot of resources from, obviously, just to be scientific, not to just put my opinion on what's going on today. Great. So let's talk about why is it called the coronavirus, though? Why? And I have two images over here, and I think we can draw some um, guesses from here. But if you could quickly try to guess, we have Elisa that's saying um, crown spice. That is completely true. Lynn as well. Um, anybody want to take a guess of what's going on with like the upper white picture? This one over here, what's going on? So this, what it is, is, um, you know, the, the sun. It's like the halo-like thing. It's the thing that comes out of the sun, you know, because the sun is not just a round thing. It's like a bubbling volcano all around. So they also call this the corona. So for those two reasons, they named this the coronavirus. And it really is related to the shape of the virus that we're going to see in a second. And by the way, guys, um, the coronavirus itself, this is the structure of it. I want to point out that the virus does not have colors. You know, when you look at a virus on the microscope, for this, you actually need an el electron microscope because you cannot see with the regular microscope. They found that it looks like this, but those colors are arbitrary. People made up those colors, okay? It's so tiny that it cannot even contain a color. So they say, hey, this bite, we're going to make it yellow. This, we're going to make it green, just so that we can differentiate the par parts. So that's what happens. So if you see this virus being many different colors and many different sources, just because it's arbitrary, I just want to clarify that. So do you see those spikes? Okay, there are proteins. Inside, you have this whole thing, that's the RNA. And then you have an envelope. Thank you for saying envelope, guys. Now, 
this coronavirus, which is kind of shaped like an envelope, is actually really powerful. And it's not new, actually. What happened in 2002-2003? It was called the SARS. It's called Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. It started in 2002 and it disappeared in 2014. This same virus, or not exactly the same, its sister virus was the cause of the SARS. They call it the SARS in general. So we have a sister generation of that, or I don't know if you want to call it a cousin, um, of what's going on right now. So coronavirus is really is saying like the large family. It's not saying, it's like your family name. There are many different types within that family name. And it all caused resp respiratory illness. So I listened to, to some interviews about people who were affected by the virus and they said they felt like they were um, underwater. They had to gasp for air because they were swimming underwater. So it's affecting the lungs. It's affecting the lungs to a point that you can't breathe anymore. Your oxygen level is going to keep dropping and dropping and dropping to a state that it is critical that your organs are going to shut down. That's how death is happening right now. So when you are admitted at the hospital, they probably will give you some oxygen first, monitor um, you know, how your organs are doing. They're probably going to take a CT scan of your lungs and if determined that you have uh, some lung problems according to um, you know, the radiology or CT scans that you have taken, then they can say I th maybe you have um, you know, COVID-19 because tests is not available uh, all around. Now, this, the one that we have right now is called the SARS-CoV-2. It's a little different than the SARS-CoV-1 that we had for the SARS that happened in 2002. But as you can see, they're so similar that the names are almost the same. So they're sisters in my head. And this is actually the name of the virus. So coronavirus is a family. If you want to say that one that's happening right now, you have to call it the SARS-CoV-2. What's COVID-19 though? COVID-19 is the name we have given it as a disease, not as per se the, the virus. Virus has follow kind of a certain way to be named okay we can't just name it whatever there is a you know a sequence that they follow to be named but COVID-19 is the name of the disease not the virus I hope I clarified that let me know if you have questions now um, this is a National Institute of Health it says it's detected on um, in aerosol for about three hours it's um, on copper Okay, for four hours, cardboards for 24 hours. So that's why I see friends who are just leaving their box outside of their home for days until they pick it up. And then two to three days on, on plastic and stainless steel. So that's how, you know, it can just survive for a while. However, it's going to eventually die if they have nowhere to go, if they don't find a home within that period. But, you know, be mindful that it can still live in our environment like that in surfaces. Now, I already talked about name versus a virus versus disease name. But I want to also point out this with some other ones as well. So HIV is the, is it the virus or is it the disease name, guys? Can you participate on the chat? If you are around HIV, is this the virus or is it the disease? Thank you, everybody, for saying the virus. Perfect. AIDS is really just what happens from that virus. It is the disease. Okay. Measles versus rubella. Which one? Okay. Is measles the name of the virus or is it the name of the disease? You can say um, V or D. Yeah. Perfect disease. Okay. Everybody's getting it correct. You guys are awesome. So this is a disease, okay? So we just need to differentiate between what's a, a disease name and because, you know, I think as medical professionals, we understand a lot better, but sometimes it's just, 
you know, makes me not upset, but it's just, you know, I, I want to, you know, tell people, hey guys, what you're calling the coronavirus is actually not the disease name. So I want to walk up to them and say that. Um, so the cause of this, you know, it's really this. And I just wanted to take you out again to this quick YouTube video just to show you how the lungs are affected. So this is a 3D scan that they have done. Um, and it shows how affected your lungs are. As you can see inside, the branches of the lungs are completely affected. That's how you can't breathe anymore. And I found this fascinating just because it really gives us an insight of what's happening in your body when you have as you know now, COVID-19, which is a disease name, not coronavirus. Well, coronavirus is the one that's going to cause this. So again, I just wanted to quickly show you, you know, I don't think we, we have to keep watching this, but I just want to continue over here. So they're going to go deeper and deeper and deeper into the smaller structures of your lungs, the alveoli. And you can see a lot of um, you know, a lot of parts are compromised. So that was uh, the whole thing about you know why do we actually um, die from coronavirus? And there's this um, term that is called novel. Well, when you see the news, you know they see this novel coronavirus. <laughs> what that actually it means is that it's new to us humans. Okay, it's not new to the bat, but it's new to me right now. And we can't fight it. That's what it actually means. When they call the novel coronavirus, it means that it's new to the human body. And, um, ooh, so Elisa is saying, my cousins and Oren, they were identifying corona positive patients weeks ago by looking at chest scans and they were asymptomatic in hospital for other reasons like car accident. Wow, Lisa, thank you for sharing that. So yes, to, so so far what I you know heard it, it really affects the lungs. So that's why you know, but they might it might not appear. That's the thing about this virus right now. It doesn't really is asymptomatic until much later. In you know some of the interviews I heard about patients who had the virus and who were treated, they say they had to wait a long time to even get a scan because they you know, doctors didn't believe that they were affected by this because they didn't look like they really had it. They were just coughing, had a fever, felt like they were really breathing well, but they didn't seem like so um, intensely about to die until it gets really intense and then it just falls. You you know you feel like this. So thank you again for sharing that, Elisa. Now the origin again, we looked at it bats. But you know, the question is, why? I want to dive into why. And I, I did a lot of research about why the bat bat. Sorry. So this this guy, his name is Batman, right? And I'm like, that. When you start understanding the bat, you start to understand Batman is a superhero. Now I get it. So bat are known for many different reasons. First of all, they have this kind of crazy amount of energy supply. They, they have a system, kind of an energy generating system inside them that is more powerful than anything we've seen. They are also amazing as regulating their own inflammation and then I mean bats are affected all the time by virus by bacteria and they kind of group together they cluster together so they, they transmit diseases all the time among each other but somehow their body are so adapt they can just kind of you know cure themselves so easily and we don't know really how that's happening. And we would like to bring that from the bat to us, but we don't know how yet. So the bat is kind of the super animal actually. On top of that, it uses sonar system to um, understand what's going on in the, their world. And they have this crazy vision as well. So really Batman, a superhero is kind of like that. You know, there's so many things. 
Carly, you're asking high metabolism. Um, I, I'm guessing it could also be in that case. Um, I haven't exactly read about high metabolism. But my focus, sorry, was just really about how they combat, you know, all diseases and how their system, their immune system, their body system is already so capable, the capability that we don't have humans. So a lot of things come from the bat and we don't uh, really realize that sometimes, but then when we trace it back, we're like, oh, this is where it came from. Now they say, you know, if bats were just living their peaceful life, it would be fine. However, what happens? You have just seen in this movie, right? This two minute clip that I showed you. So they were, you know, there was a tree, Thank you for bearing with my um, drawings. I always try to draw, and I think it's such a powerful way to educate. However, I'm terrible at it. So there was banana trees, and what they did is a human wanted to use that land. So they just pushed all the trees. They destroyed all of them, and the bat that was living here had to go somewhere, and they dropped their banana, the banana they were eating, and that landed in the pig's uh, system. So you know, they actually say scientists say it actually comes not just from the bat but from a human from us trying to destroy their habitat therefore um you know we're hurting ourselves as well by doing so so that was about the bat i wanted to talk a little bit about the origin not just it comes from the bat but why now you know this is kind of a little middle point okay we discovered a lot already about what viruses versus bacteria, their composition, how they replicate. We also seen how the coronavirus, you know, it's kind of this big umbrella that has um, this thing called SARS-CoV-2. That's the sister of what happened in SARS in 2002. And actually because of that, they are thinking that they can find a vaccine a little faster because they had the sister's sister virus earlier. I can't promise anything, guys. Um, I'm not the researcher, but I'm just only hoping that's all I can do right now. So in this break, okay, you'll feel, to, feel free to stretch your legs and everything. And I want to show you again, I'm going to take you to the YouTube as, as well. Um, and maybe I should get the paid version at some point so I don't have to show you commercials. But this is something really funny that I found on the internet, and it's this guy who works at the CDC, and he talks about uh, movies and what their things related to um, the pandemic um, drives him crazy because it's so wrong or sometimes um, it is correct. So this is guy dissecting as a professional um, those movies. It's like us dissecting what's happening, let's say in a, sh in a movie, in a show that has a dental office, we can point out they're not wearing the mask correctly. They might actually putting it upside down or you know they don't have their loops or things like that. So this is basically what this guy is doing and I hope it's gonna work. It worked before. I'm not sure why the internet is not so fast anymore. And at the same time, I apologize if it's slow. Sometimes um, they say the world is living on Zoom right now. So Zoom used to have a much faster, better HD, you know, quality capacity. And now because everybody's using it, um, things are slowing down a little bit. So I hope this is the case because I found this really, really funny. So let's just try it one more time. Hmm. I'm trying to think, can I try to come back to this after a few slides? Maybe it is the internet connection, maybe it is the Zoom connection, something that we can't really um, find a reason for, but if that's okay with you, let me know. I would love to just come back and just show you those oh. uh, funny clips. Oh, actually, no, I think I heard some noise, which I thought was coming from the no okay all right thanks for staying with me we're going to come back to this and if not you can write this down it's called disease expert breaks down pandemic scenes from film and tv okay so you can find it easily on the internet it's very entertaining and i thought we could use that as a as a break point right now i'm just going to try one more time Oh. 
if you don't mind that, I'm just going to do YouTube and I'm just going to type it in as well. Or this is telling me that YouTube is slow. Okay. If YouTube is slow, I don't know what else. Okay, we're going to come back. Great. And, you know, let's chat, chat a little bit for on top of that then. What are the things that drives you crazy when you see a show uh, or movie that has health or dental in it? Are there things that you can point out and say that was so wrong? Or when you see, you know, those stock photos on like dentistry, they drive me crazy. You know, PPE, thank you for sharing that. They never have proper PPE. What, what are they missing a lot of times? They're missing in my eyes, those, you know, eyewear. Yes, eyewear, always. And then, you know, the mask, How, how's that going with their mask? They're just wearing it on their chin and they're smiling, right? That's not what we're supposed to do, especially after this. I don't think we're gonna wear those masks on our chin as one well wear it back up. Um, and hardly ever lay the patient all the way back. That is true. Thank you so much, Keiko, for sharing that. They always, you know, smiling like a nicely seated position, right? How we're supposed to do our job with that, right? Um, what else is um, hair down? I love that one. <laughs> the reason why I love that one is because. Um, I mean, especially now, I'm going to tie my hair. I'm not just going to tie my hair, actually. I'm going to do a good job so that it's always kind of inside a little, like, I'm, I'm just going to buy one of those um, big, uh, not shield, what do you call it, like hat, surgical hat, so that I don't have to expose my hair at all. Um, another thing are the instruments. Obviously, they're not done on professional, so they're just holding it at, like, kind of a, a weird, like, weird angle. Uh, they don't have the right instruments and they're you know anyhow CPR in movies makes me laugh thank you Becca for sharing that Jerry you're like good one that's a good one they always make it so dramatic what else they also make it so that um, they're breaking someone's rib <laughs> okay so let's talk about immunity sorry the YouTube YouTube is not working right now immunity I want to walk through what immunity means and also what it means to have a vaccine because in my head that is the big question mark we are all waiting for a vaccine to come but what does that even mean to be vaccinated so let's go back to dental hygiene school basically and here you can see this is a screenshot of student rdh but this is really the summer of what you have to know about immunity so i want you to look here is called acquired adaptive immunity. So in, innate, it means it's, it's in us. And then what's acquired is that we, for example, get the vaccine, that's acquired. Let's talk about immunity. Let's start, let's start with immunity for a second. So when you get the virus or, or the bacteria, what your body does, it's gonna find it automatically. Most of the time we're fine. Um, macrophages are going to come, they're going to kind of, if I can draw this, they're going to destroy it into small little parts, and then you'll have other um, parts of the body, such as the T cells and things like that, they're going to come to recognize it, but I'm going to skip many different steps to tell you that there's going to be memory cells. Your body, your cells are going to remember that attack that happened, that is key, okay? but you do it naturally all the time, every single day. Now, you can acquire that immunity as well. Acquire means it came from something else. It doesn't necessarily come from a vaccine. So let's look at it together. I want you to just pay attention to those words, naturally versus artificially. Naturally means it came from um, a human. Artificially mean you gave someone an injection. Artificially is an injection. So let's talk about, first of all, naturally active acquired an immunity. So active. Active means the body needed to do something. Needed to fight it, needed to memorize it. So the flu that you get and you recover from, that is 
naturally because you ne didn't get an injection from the flu. We're not talking about the vaccine here. We're just talking about something that lives in the environment and then active because your body had to actively fight it and actively remember it. What about naturally passive? Naturally passive means, okay, you got it from the environment and or from another human being, but in this case, your body didn't really have to memorize it or fight it. They didn't really have to create it because you were given it from, in this case, antibodies from the mother. So that was passed on to you. You didn't have to do any work. Let's talk about artificial. Artificial is again getting an injection. Active meaning your body had to do something with it. This is the vaccine guys. This is what we are talking about. This is what I want to highlight today. So the MMR, measles, mumps, you know, the, the flu shot that we get, all of those are artificially active acquired immunity. So I don't know if you want to remember it as AAA -A -A, or AAAI, but I think AA is enough, just like, you know, the, the bacteria that causes um, aggressive periodontitis. So AA, you get something in you that's going to trigger your body to respond to fight and to memorize it that's that what's artificially passive acquired immunity artificially passive mean okay you got it from an injection obviously but passive saying so you're going to give it given the solution already you didn't have to fight anything you didn't have to study for it you were given the answers already such as when it's too late when you have an exposure to heavy they're going to give this to you so that you can fight it. Here's the solution. Any questions around the four types of acquired immunity? I just wanted to overview what we already learned in DENA or DENA hygiene school and just kind of understand that what we call the virus is including active, uh, artificially active acquired immunity. Okay, thank you Carly for saying that makes sense. Okay, so that was vaccination. Now let's talk a little bit more about vaccination and how do we create a vaccine? I'm not a vaccine expert, but I did my best to really find information and I actually have different images over here and I'm gonna try to compare it what we can see in dentistry. So um, sometimes, okay, let me draw the virus. I'm gonna draw it round, okay? This virus, what they do is they take this virus and, oh my God, you wanna see me drawing a dog with my finger? Oof. Okay, here's a dog. It's a cow, whatever you wanna call it. Anyways, so they're gonna take this virus and they're gonna um, put it in many different animals. It's gonna keep passing on, on and on and on. What happens is this vaccine actually um, kind of get reduced their um, toxicity or you know their effect. So they're taking that little thing that's you know kind of mm, a, a lot less aggressive, and they're going to put it in us, and that is called active. So our body is going to fight it, or is going to remember it. However the intensity is a lot less, so we can actually deal with that. So that is the active vaccine Korea. You know, we take an active form and put it in us. This is an image of a real tooth. What I'm trying to show you is kind of using a real tooth for us to practice. We're taking the real thing, but it's kind of dead already, or it's kind of really weak, and there, we can recognize it, we can, our body, body can practice with that. The inactive is like the type of not, it's like a completely dead, dead thing. It's not living. So you take the same virus, okay, but you boil it or, you know, you, you do many different things, put it in, in some sort of a formaldehyde, and this thing is inactive. It's not living anymore. It's really the shell. It's really like kind of a dummy. Like when you do CPR training, the dummy, that, that's exactly what inactive is. So we're going to take that and give it to our body. So our body can, can understand, can do a practice test with this dummy version. 
So usually, our, um, it depends on what type of vaccine it is, but it can be active, it can be inactive. Now, the, the last type on the right side is the recombinant. I don't know if you've seen this in pharmacology yet or have heard of that, but what it is is, let's say this is a virus, and you remember there are some RNA, DNA it is. So what it is is giving part of it, not, not everything, but let's say they're taking this part out. And it's kind of giving some a partial virus to our body. Just like you see here, okay, you have a tooth that needs some restoration. It's not a full tooth. I just wanted to try to find an example that can resonate. Um, and we're going to just, I don't know what in that case what they would do, but obviously it needs some restoration. And this, um, let's say if you were in dental school, that would be great practice. So you give your body this form of virus and the, uh, the body needs to adjust to it to understand what's going on and to form the other parts, but it's really a whole practice. So I hope by being able to communicate the three types of va vaccine generally that, that are happening. There are more subcategories to those. Okay, and I don't wanna just categorize them all in here, but in general, this is what's happening. Now, let's continue our story here with um, vaccination or immunity. There's something called the herd immunity. Did you guys ever heard about it? Herd immunity or community immunity or social immunity. Depends on you know how they call it. Okay, thank you, Jen. Thank you, um, Megan, Carla, Rebecca, everybody for saying yes. Okay, so what it really means is that you are going to have a subset of the population that are immune to something. So you don't have to have everybody to be immune, to be vaccinated. You need, you need a certain amount of people in the community to be immune, to get the vaccine in order to stop the transmission of the disease. So here, as you can see, so the blue is people who are healthy. In yellow, you have the people who are immunized. So they got the vaccine. And the red are the people who are contagious. So in this case, as you can see, I'm gonna go jump from the first picture to the last picture in our case. Okay. So if you have immunized people, as you can see, a lot of them here in yellow are immunized. They had the vaccine. And you had a few people in the group that are contagious. Not, not a whole lot of them, but a few people. Because there's barrier, there's a whole wall of people who had the vaccine in the middle, the disease is not going to continue passing on. It's going to stop because the next person you touch or you cough on was immune already. And that person is just going to stop it already. So that is called the herd immunity. You don't need everybody to be vaccinated. You need some people to be vaccinated. And this is really important concept in community health as well, because people who are, um, you know, sick already, are older or too young, they can't be vaccinated a lot of times. You can't vaccinate everybody. So when that happens, we are still protected though by this herd immunity because the majority of people have been able to be vaccinated. Does that make sense, guys? And you can put it on the chat and I'm just gonna quickly look at everybody just to see if we are all muted because I do hear some noise and uh, it would just nice to have a little bit more of a good sound environment. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so that is herd immunity because I hear it on the news and um, it's, you know, they just keep repeating it. I don't even know if the reporters know what they're talking about, but I wanted just to clarify this concept. Perfect. Okay. Now, healthcare professionals. That needs to be Ooh. Um, there's someone who does not have their microphone muted. Can I ask everybody to mute okay, so themselves, like please? I hear a male voice right now. Can everybody mute themselves, please? Sorry. I have to take a few seconds to make sure that everybody's muting right now. If that's okay, I'm just going to take a few seconds here just to find 
not that I'm pointing at anybody, I'm just trying to make it clear for everybody so we can um, have good quality. Hmm. I haven't been able to find that person, but thank you for trying. All right, thanks for staying with me. Ooh, <laughs> thank you, Lali, for saying that. Perfect, let's continue our story. Now, healthcare professional, we have to be immunized, right? We need vaccines. And before you apply for dental hygiene school or when you start it, they probably ask you to submit some sort of list of what vaccine you had. If you didn't, you would have to um, get it. Now, those are the vaccine. This is by the CDC, okay? There might be a few more, but this is the CDC recommendation for healthcare professionals. That include Hep B, the flu, the MMR, um, the varicella, the Tdap, and then, you know, the last one is really just for those who are more exposed um, to, oops, sorry, to the specific, um, oops, disease. So anyhow, you have a, a few vaccines that you needed to really get in order to even start school. So by doing that, you're just providing, you know, this blanket, not just for the community, but also between your yourself and the patient. So I just wanted to bring this list from the CDC guidelines. Now we learned about virus and how you can vaccinate yourself. And I know there's some discussion out there about, you know, we don't actually need to be vaccinated. My body, my choice and everything. And I don't want to take a, you know, a side, but I do understand by the process of vaccination that we're doing good for our own body and also creating this herd immunity. So it's good for everybody. So I just wanted to point that out. Oops. YouTube really doesn't want to work anymore with us. So I'm going to just try to continue. And it might be a Zoom problem as well. So now let's continue with some of the deadliest or some of the really important viruses that affected us as a, in a community or in our history. Anybody know about the Spanish flu? Anybody here know about the Spanish flu? Have you heard about it? Honestly, it wasn't really in my vocabulary until recently, right? It's because, you know, now the coronavirus, we are all very in high alert about what's going on um, with just viruses in general. So the Spanish flu was about 100 years ago. And then we had the swine flu as well. I grouped them together just because they come from the same family. Did you guys ever heard of what's called the H1N1? Yes, so this is the cause of the Spanish flu and also the swine flu, H1N1 influenza, that's what they call it. Okay, so influenza though, okay, can we dive into what influenza means? anybody know what the origin of the name is like the coronavirus I like to talk about the origin because it gives us like kind of an idea of the virus or the disease itself anybody want to take a guess which um, hmm, let's say which language this came from it came from a different language not English something else anybody want to take a guess it sounds like a Christian Latin Spanish okay let's continue What's the land of um, pizza? Italy. <laughs> yes, it came from the land of pizza. So influenza, so it's earned its name from um, Italian. That means influence of the cold. Of the cold. Why? Because, you know, this, you know, the virus, they didn't really know it was a virus back then. But, you know, when you're sick, usually it's in the winter, right? When it's cold, then you get also 
cough, have fever, that's usually in the winter. So they kind of say influence of the cold, not meaning that cold itself created this. So I did a deep dive into why, actually, why do we get the influenza or the, um, the virus more often in the winter? And they still exactly can't find a reason, but so, um, you know, sometimes they say, well, uh, temperature matters, also um, humidity. In the winter, it's drier. And when it's um, more humid, virus tend to spread less. And there's discussion right now also that in the world, we have some areas of the world which are less affected and they look at the temperature and say, those countries, you know, they, it's um, much higher temperature. That's why they're not affected by this. Um, so it's, I'm not saying that we can draw a conclusion from that, but there's some relationship to that and the world influenza came from Italian that says influence of the cold. And you know, it's incorrect in this case then to say that influenza or the flu is only in the winter, it's detected all year long. So why the Spanish flu? Well, it's, it's just, you know, the origin. They thought back then that it kind of came from Spain, which is, you know, difficult to address because they had World War One back then, okay? So it was around when World War I was ended. And you know, it infected 500 million people on earth and death, death. I think we had some great answers before. 50 to 100 million people died. That's like 5% of the population died. Can you imagine? If, if we had 100 people with us right now, and we have about over 50 people in our webinar right now, let's say we multiply by two, five of us will die. That, that's how deadly this thing was. So they say this is the mother of pandemic. So Spanish flu 100 years ago, the mother of pandemic, and they learned so much from them. They, they've been able to understand more um, health settings, you know, being able to stop the spread of pandemic because of what happened a hundred years ago. I find this very fascinating. Now let's talk about the swine flu now, 2009. Anybody re remember the swine flu? Anybody was affected or just kind of had to stay home or, you know, took extra precautions at your clinic or at home because of the swine flu? Um, so Carissa, you remember, Christine, not affected, but you remember, um, Keiko, you say, um, got my uh, a guy in my high school algebra class, stay home for two weeks, okay? Erin, you were not affected, but okay, a lot of you remember that happening. So here are two types. So again, H1N1 is the one that actually caused it. Actually, I should probably talk about what H and N means, right? Are you guys curious about that? What H and N is? If it is, I'm gonna take um, you know two minutes to talk about it. You can tell me in the chat if you're curious. If not, you know I can continue um, with uh, the webinar. But I thought in my head, you know, H and like why, why do they give them those kind of names? Um, okay. So let's see, let's see, okay. Um, okay, let's, let's talk about this then. Thank you very much for participating. It just gives me an idea. So H and N, ooh, what are they? Well, before that, I wanna draw you a virus. Again, I'm just gonna draw an envelope virus and I'm gonna take two colors. One is blue and I'm gonna take another color, the green, and I'm just gonna make it dot circles, okay. So H, H actually stands for hemagglutinin. Hemagglutinin. I'm not going to write the whole word, but it's called hemagglutinin. It is a protein. It's a protein. And let's say, okay, I'm just, I should have taken actually the blue. Say H is, for example, hemagglutinin, and it's the one that you see over here. So that's H. And then the other one, N. N stands for neuro mini days, neuro mini days, and that's N. So they say, I mean, I haven't seen people agreeing yet, so, but there are about 10 types of N 
and they say they are about 17 types of H. So it's the expression of the protein on the outside layer of the virus. So when you have, um, there are 17 types. So if you have the first type, you call the H1, right? And in our case, the, the label, whatever they see here as N1. So that's why when you see something like H5N1, you can see that maybe it was a different protein and maybe I can, can use purple and it looked like this. And that's why it's called, you know, H5. It was the number five of the H. So, you know, I, I can't really say that uh, that was, it looked like that. But just to give you an idea that, you know, the kind of names that we are given um, are viruses. So that's why H1N1 or H5N1, that's where they come from, the shape of it or, or what's on the surface of the virus. Uh, I just wanted to show you two things. So this is the swine flu, right? This is the AV, can you help me here? Um, the bird flu, what, what is the word for that? Um, AV, aviary, thank you. Okay, I was blinking, aviary. I'm like, how do I spell that all of a sudden? Okay, we have the aviary flu. As you can see, aviary flu is a lot more deadly than the swine flu, but the swine flu, just like any flu, is really about our respiratory system. That's where it is affecting us. Now, the H1N1, or what we see right now, is completely different, okay? We cannot confuse them. They're completely different types. It's like eating an apple and eating oranges, they're fruits, but it's completely different. Although it all is affecting our respiratory system. Now we know a little bit more about the swine flu. Um, I really quickly wanted to talk about uh, type. So there are, when we talk about influenza, there are type A, B, and C. There are more type A's generally than there are type B's there are type C. So you can say, um, have you ever heard that expression influenza or A, type A or something like that? Because they're just referring to which type they are. That's a way for them to label them. So that's just, you know, the category that they have designated themselves. And I'm taking this directly from the CDC to um, understand the concept of influenza. Now, when you talk about other viruses, it's not going to be type A, B, or C. I'm just talking about influenza right now. When we talk about the coronavirus, we're not going to be A, B, and C. Now, let's talk about HIV. We're about 30 minutes from finish, or maybe even less than that, and I hope it has been so far um, useful and helpful. I just want to add two more viruses that really shaped our history, HIV. Let's take a quick guess of how many people do you think died from HIV? Just to take a wild guess. Millions for sure. And thanks for everybody who's saying it's been very useful. One million, okay. All I can say is up. We're gonna play this game, up. Ooh, 35, Janice, Janice. Okay, that was a good number. 35 actually is about right. It killed 35 million people. You know, the coronavirus haven't, you know, have this many deaths yet. It's about 60,000 right now, okay? But it's still rising, so we have no conclusion yet. But HIV is like on top, it's like there. So that's why it's really important to understand this because this is actually really um, how viral therapy also have evolved a lot because they really try to find for a really, really long time to find a cure. We do not have a cure, but we can help patients feel better, live longer. There's no cure yet. So it is one of the largest pandemic in the world. By the way, guys, what does pandemic versus endemic? Anybody want to take a guess? Endemic means, as you can see, all over the world. Thank you, Carissa. Endemic. Endemic means it's more like contained within a certain region. 
okay? So that's what the difference is. Um, just in terms of definition, this is community health, pandemic versus endemic. So you might hear some endemic, um, some about endemic um, in certain communities only, correct? So not everything is an endemic, but maybe it is in certain parts of Africa, like polio, still, it is a problem. So we can't say, you know, it lives here, but um, endemic can be uh, some places we don't see, and or it can also be here that other places of the world do not have. Thank you very much, guys, for participating again. Now let's continue over here. So we have the virus. Let's talk about the name of the disease. It's called AIDS, right? And it stands for acquired immuno deficiency syndrome. Okay, so you're immunocompromised. That's what it means. And I have a picture of the virus, but actually, no, on the right side, that's what I really wanted to show. What is this? What animal is this? That one is, yes, an ape chimpanzee, perfect. So it is a chimpanzee. And they say it came from chimpanzee back in the days. Well, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is here. So in the 1900s, it started to spread. Okay, well, it was probably existing earlier and chimpanzee had that already. They actually found it in monkeys, they have found it in gorillas, but they say, you know, the one that's closest to us right now, it's found in chimpanzees. And um, so they, they took a blood sample from a man in Congo. So we went all the way to Africa. We took a blood sample. And then we say, hey, this is what it looks like to humans as well. So how did that come, you know, how, how did it spread from Congo or, you know, just the forests of Africa to North America or everywhere else in the country? What's because they think it is called, the, they call this the bush hmm, meat trading. Meaning, you know, and I don't want to judge at all here. They, over there, you know, they, they hunt and they eat chimpanzees or um, monkeys. And I don't, again, I don't want to judge here. It's probably not what we are used to, but in some parts of the world, you know, they had to do what they had to do. And it's, all, it's also cultural. So they thought, this is the, just a theory. We never know exactly how it started, but this is a theory. That person who went to hunt the chimpanzee had a little cut somewhere. Okay, and had a little um, opening. And then when this person got in contact with this, I'm not going to try to draw this, this chimpanzee, it got infected. And then that spread through direct contact again to more people. So in the 1980s, okay, so now let's just travel. Um, all the way to 1980s, that's really where the rise, and I don't know if you guys were, um, you know, um, around in 1980s, you know, how old you were, but that's where really the research was starting to kick in, or they're really just trying to understand what this was about. And I remember that when I was younger, people were talking about the HIV is something that only a certain population would get, such as the gay community, but it wasn't that. They were just making speculations. They didn't understand it yet. And also they thought there is a also um, in the Midwest, so here in the Midwest, you know, th there's an area where they did blood transfusion and it kind of started to spread around that community. So they trace it back to, okay, it's transfers by blood. So a lot of times all we can do is really trace back what happened, what happened and who they contacted and, you know, what, what did they do? Okay, so this is kind of how they thought it was going, um, uh, so the, the, how they discovered it. Another community, they really looked at it as into the community they, um, that used heroin because what? Of needles, right? 
So they were using the same needle again, again, and again. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Rebecca. Share needles. That's why um, they came to the conclusion, maybe it's blood. And then, of course, they did many tests, but they really had to dig into what was the origin and what was the cause and how it was transmitted. Because sometimes the cause is not the problem. I mean, that's just nice to solve. But what we really need to do is find a problem. I mean, sorry, find a solution to stop it. Here, let's go back to um, the effect it has. So the effect on the body is really lowering the immune system. Do you have those white blood cells? And you know, the, the CD4 is, is one type of blood cell, but their count gets lower. I think it's about 100 or 150 or so, when a normal person would have about 500 or so of them. So your army is about five times smaller than you know, a normal uh, a person who was not affected by HIV. So, you know, it transfer everywhere. It also shows in your mouth. That's why we, they can have ulcers more often. Ulcers are huge, okay? They can have Kaposi sarcoma. They can have linear gingival, uh, so some the, the red lines along the gingival margin, L, they call it the LGE. So they have a number of things. It doesn't mean that they're going to die, but we have to be careful because their immune system have been compromised. Now, transmission. This is what really interests us because as dental professional, how are we going to make sure that we are protecting ourselves correctly? And the magic word, uh, sorry, the magic word is obviously always standard precaution, right? But Let's just dig in a little bit more into HIV. So it transmits by sexual contact, needles, okay? You directly get into the blood or mother to baby. Those are the only three ways this can be transmitted. So in the dental setting, we have to be careful with needles, yes. But saliva, it is not transmitted through saliva, sweat, and tears. So if anybody asks you if the patient has HIV is even concerned, you know, I think you can very intelligently tell them that this is not how it spreads. Not even mosquitoes, okay? And not fecal or wild either, nor air and water. So ultrasonic, all of that is okay, unless there's blood in there and it directly lands on a place on your body that is open wound. So that is transition. So I just wanted to discover HIV together with you guys and understand the history that it also, the virus came from uh, chimpanzee. Now, another fascinating, fascinating disease, and this is the last one I'm gonna present today, is measles. There are many, many viruses out there. Why did I choose measles? It's because of its fascinating history. So I just want to point out here, you can see the little dots. Those are characteristic and those called complex dots, complex spots. The rash you get is very characteristic of measles, although there are many different things like chicken pox, small pox that will also have um, little spots. Measles, now let's go to the history of it. Oh, this part is fascinating. Who is this? Can anybody tell me who this is? Columbus, right? What year did he come to North America? Nah, 1492, you're also awesome. Okay, Columbus came to North America in 1492. Hmm. The only problem is that when he came here with his people and invaded the native land, he also brought a whole cocktail of viruses and bacteria that the world, you know, the native world didn't have before, was not exposed to. There were this massive ocean between them. So through those ships, through those people, they brought bacteria and viruses. They had horses also, so they brought a whole new range of uh, micro microbes with the horses as well. What about, um, you know, the other um, 
sorry, they, they had pigs and things like that also in the ships. So anyhow, this native world was suddenly exposed to things that they never had before. And one of them was measles. And measles, I mean, it's very sad. They say about 80 to 95%, okay, of those native community were affected and died because of those diseases that they brought to North America. And I didn't know that until the research, but I find this very fascinating. So the number of native significantly reduced by people, animals from a different country traveling to a different land. So that is measles. I mean, so there's a lack of information, right? It's not like they wrote down everything and they didn't have really, you know, the, med the technology that we have right now to detect exactly what it is. But they attribute that, a lot of it, to measles. And they even say certain population got totally extinct. You know, there's some demographers out there, you know, um, one of them is named uh, Cook. Noble Cook, and he says things like that. 80% people died because of that. So that was kind of a little bit of the history, I think, that I want to tie back to what we're learning today about the virus, because it's not just the virus, it's about, you know, being able to travel. So traveling made everything, in a sense, worse. Because if you didn't travel, this would have not been, um, a problem and you are correct. Um, Elisa you're asking is this likely the ones that were carrying had immunity and you're correct. People who had it because in Europe that yeah that it was there they built immunity and Jerry you're asking did he bring smallpox they are speculating that as well. Of course we can't know for sure but they said that before Columbus there were a lot of things that were not here. No typhoid, no smallpox, and no measles. So, um, going back to the story over here, you know, in 1912, okay, 1912, it became a national crisis in the US. I mean, we had the 1918 Spanish flu, 1912 measles. I mean, back then, you know, our chances of survival were so low. They say actually, because they didn't really have a cure for all the things that, you know, we are curing right now, your average survival, I mean, your average um, age, it would be about 40 to 50 when you die. I can't even imagine that because I, you know, I'm, getting to my 40s so therefore I think maybe if I only had seven you know five more years to live but anyhow that was the case um, back then and you know they were an average of 60 6,000 sorry death every single year from measles okay and then in 1963 they invented the vaccine and then the number got reduced and reduced and now we don't have measles anymore. We get the vaccine from the beginning. This is a requirement. So that was the history of measles. Now let's talk about the effect it has on us. Well, it um, really affects our respiratory system as well. It's super highly contagious. And it obviously involves fever and um, itchy eyes, runny nose, but again, the rash. It, um, it's a distinct feature of that. But the transmission of it is terrible too. Remember this that I showed earlier? Measles spreads through aerosol, meaning the tiny little parts are gonna be suspended for hours and hours. If you had a powerful vent, if your neighbor had it, I could get it too. That is aerosol, that's airborne. So um, you know, measles, thank God, we don't have it anymore. Thank you to the virus, to the scientists who created a solution for this. And I just want to end our webinar here by showing you this.
and I'm gonna make it bigger over here too. And this has been circulating on the internet and I just would love to give credit, but I'm not sure which organization originally had this. So I just wanted to show you what's going on here. And we guessed correctly, we had uh, someone who guessed correctly, AIDS is about 25 to 35, as you can see over here. And I'm gonna get my pen to try to circle a few things for you guys. So I really wanna highlight, this is, I mean, I love, first of all, the graphic, and I love that you can actually see a little bit of um, the, um, the uh, you know, the, the magnitude of it. So you have HIV AIDS, about 25 to 35. What's a big one? What's a big one, right? Spanish flu. Okay, what's a bigger than that? Smallpox. We don't have smallpox anymore either. Um, I didn't put it here because I know we had two hours and I didn't want to overwhelm, but um, I'm going to continue my series of virus as a CE course and also for our students as well. Um, so uh, if you would like to be in touch, if you'd like to receive um, those as well, you can let me know. So we had the smallpox. What about the plague, actually? What they say they call the Black Death, and that was a long, long, long time ago. And they called the bubonic plague. That, you know, actually, guys, this is not a virus. This is a bacteria. That's why it's not in our webinar. I think some, um, you know, some students that I taught were confused. They thought, you know, the black death was also a virus. No, it was um, a bacteria. I mean, that was, uh, how many years was that? 800 years ago, right? And back then, if you imagine, the conditions were terrible. They had rats, you know, crawling everywhere all the time. Oh my God, I need to take a, a drawing class someday, guys. Okay, so that was a rat. Um, you know, rats, and it was transmitted through those animals and fleas. So anyways, that, that was the big one, 200 million. Can you imagine back then? There was not even that many population. Um, and you know, it wiped out, as they say over here, half, half of the European population got killed by the Black Death. But that was a bacteria, not a virus. So let's continue over here. We have HIV AIDS. Um, what else can we recognize as being a virus over here? The Asian flu, the Russian flu, the Hong Kong flu, okay. What about SARS? Oops. MERS, MERS is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And we have this coronavirus and we don't really know how big this dot is going to be yet, but we know that it's pretty significant at this point. And Ebola is also a virus. The swine flu, what we just talked about as well, smallpox. So as you can see, a lot of it is cholera. A lot of, no, no, sorry, cholera is, um, it's a bacteria. So a lot of it is actually caused by a virus, not just all virus, um, but some bacteria as well. But I just wanted to give some perspective of, um, you know, the history from, you know, the 1300s to right now and what, uh, you know, the big pandemics of the world. And right now while we have COVID-19 is on the map. So thank you everybody for being here. Um, Thank you for sharing, Elise, that is the visualcapitalist.com, history of pandemic deadliest. Thank you very much. Any questions? We have a few minutes left on the webinar. I just want to make sure that I can answer all the questions. Although, you know, I would like to also say again that I'm not a virus specialist per se, but um, I'm really am passionate about sharing information in a way that everybody can understand. Uh, thank you for saying that this was a great webinar. Um, Jerry, you're asking about using Cavitron. So Cavitron is great. Um, Jerry, um, can you tell me what your question is a little bit more? Uh, if we can talk about Cavitron for a second. Cavitron, you know, if you use it, what is suspended in the air, right? Very, very tiny aerosol and also droplet at the same time. So it is a problem. That's why we need to reinforce our PPE. 
like just the mass we have, it's not going to do it. I mean, I think we, we can really take this opportunity to make sure that we are more protected now. I, I, I'm sure all the offices are going to do that. I'm sure the awareness is much greater. I actually was thinking about that today, actually, Jerry. So, you know, when we look at pictures of back in the day, Santa Hygiene, what were they doing? They were just doing it with their bare hands. Right? Anybody lived through that era? I didn't, but I see pictures and, you know, I can't believe that we had bare hands. Yes, Jerry's saying, you know, I assist with bare hands. So that was back in the days. And I think we would look back 20 years, 30 years from now saying, how did we use power instruments? So the piezo, the cavitron, without having this protection, it's crazy. I think we're going to go to that point. And I think it's a positive thing in a way, just to make sure that we are more protected. And you say, Lynn, I graduated 1987 and gloves just started. So that's very recent too, right? And that's all related to um, HIV. Once they knew that it was blood, um, you know, they, it, not that gloves per se stopped blood from happening, but, you know, that was a barrier. So um, HIV had something to do with this as well. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, share that I, what I thought too today was like, Mm, we're going to look back and be horrified at what we did. Um, I hope nobody in this group caught anything because of aerosol, but I really hope that we can reinforce our PPE. It's not just mask. Hair. Oh my God, hair. I have so much anxiety about hair now. I don't think I'm going to shave my head, but I'm going to wear something so I can wash it. And thank you everybody, Jerry, for... Um, saying that this was good teaching, Rebecca. Um, you're saying, oh, you had student RDH. That's amazing. I'm glad you, are you an RDH or um, are you a student, Rebecca? Um, Melissa, I did record this, okay? I know sometimes things happen with Zoom that I record it and I lose it. But if it's there, what I can do is I can, I'm going to put it on a YouTube private um, link. And I can share that with you. However, um, if, if your friend sees it, the only thing is that that person would not be able to get CE credits because you are here. Rebecca, you're graduated. Congratulations. If anybody in the group has been practicing for a while, Rebecca is a brand new graduate starting to work. And it's a very funny time to be working. I would love to, if anybody could share some of their positive feedback just to say, you know, it's going to be okay. Dental hygiene is still going to be a great profession. Um, anybody can just share some positivity. That would be amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, lastly, oh, Lori, you had student RDH, so I just love seeing our graduates come back. You know, I probably will do this for another 50 years of my life, try to teach as much as I can. But if you like this webinar, again, I'm going to continue with more details about each type of virus, okay? Um, I'm just going to continue making series. This was more like kind of an overview, but I want to dive in into the smallpox. I want to dive into chickenpox because people confuse them all the time, and they are not the same at all. Carissa, you say you use LA exam. That is amazing. Thank you for sharing that as well. A um, lot of you actually were with student RGH. I am very thankful that you are still here with me. Melissa, thank you so much for saying 20 years and is still healthy. Melissa, as well, you use student RGH. Wow. And you can tell me how many years you've been practicing here. So Melissa had 30 years of experience over here. We have somewhere five, one, 32, Lynn, applause to you. You're in two, 13, 2019 grad, woof. What a time to be graduating. We have 10 years, 13, four, 34, Diana. 12 years, okay, Megan, 2019. And some of you, Lisa has assisting, assisted before, okay. Well, you know, guys, if you just graduated as well, like Adriana, don't be discouraged by this, okay. I think a, a lot of 
those who have worked a long time can still tell you this is a great pro profession. And you know, now with the awareness, I think there's even more things to do. And uh, Diana says, still going strong, started with no gloves and no mask either. Can you imagine? So we're gonna look back at right now what we're doing saying, I can't believe we did dentistry in those conditions. Robert, 51 years? Wow, that is crazy. Thank you for sharing that. Well, congratulations for staying strong for 51 years. Um, and Alyssa, you're saying it's a big wake up call. It is a complete wake up call. And in a way, I'm thankful that we have the opportunity right now to address this. And everybody who's saying wow to Robert, who's saying congratulations, I love this positivity. Um, it really is inspiring to see all of you being one community and being able to share all the things that you have done together. Can you imagine, guys, if you just graduated working 51 years in dentistry? Can you imagine that? Like the tenacity that, you know, I mean, I would love to interview you, Robert, just to see what you have seen. I, I, can't, I can't even imagine. That would be a really fun conversation. You know what we should do, Robert? We should invite some of young graduates and you and Diana as well, and then kind of chat. You know, have you seen an Ellen and they like she's asking the millennials and the Gen Z saying, dial this phone, and it's a dial phone, like an old one, right? And the young generation just have no clue how to dial the phone. I think it'll be fun. I think it'll be fun. So we can do that. Okay. Thank you. Oh, and you are one of the founder of AACD. Can you um, spell to us what AACD stands for? Um, Elisa is asking any left-handed hygienists, if so, do you have any hurdles? Um, you know, that, that would be really something to share as well because there are more and more left-handed clinicians, but you know, Generally, the bays are not designed for that. And it's very hard to teach a left-handed clinician if you're a right-handed clinician or vice versa. So um, I have seen left-handed clinicians, but I know it's, it's kind of different. Um, oh, cosmetic dentistry. Thank you, Robert. Oh, you're one of the founders of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. But wow, okay, so many achievements. Thank you, Robert, for being here today at, a, at a, such an accomplished person and someone who has so much to share as well. Uh, I hope actually we can do this interview with someone young and just for fun. You know, it's in the, nothing towards the young generation or you know, the older generation, just something to, um, you know, joke about just to have fun together and also still be a community even with 50 years of part of experience. Okay, guys, um, this is exactly five o'clock here Eastern time right now. Oh, and Robert, you're saying still love it, best job in the world. I believe it. I believe it. But was it always like that? Or did you also have some rocky moments? Because I can't imagine all being a smooth sailing, you know, profession. There must have been some other things that, you know, we are struggling with. As little as I don't know how to change my uh, system from, you know, film to digital. That could be one of them. But I imagine there are just a lot of things out there. And Diana, you're saying we have some rocky moments. And those are the things that I actually like to do as well, interview um, hygienists or dentists out there and actually provide our young generation some advice, just, just real advice, you know, money advice. I love those as well. You know, anything, not just um, about science, not just about dentistry, but things that you need to know as a person, as, as just a professional, working professional, as a family member. Um, Okay, how, um, Jerry's asking, how is CE accessed? Um, can you help me understand what you mean? You are gonna get your certificate um, in your email to CE use, this is, um, um, you know, general science. And Robert, uh, well, if you don't mind, 
I'm going to email you. If you could share your email here, that would be fantastic or not. I can also um, search back and find you. So if you don't mind that, that would be helpful. I would love to be in touch. 51 year of experience, that is really, really rare. So, um, so there's a code for this. So um, I have a recording of everybody who attended over here. Therefore, when you are done, you don't have to put a code. Um, I'm gonna be able to issue all of those to you immediately. Thank you. Thank you for asking that. Usually I know there's a code. Sometimes we implement them, but literally, I'm gonna tell you honestly, we had um, 50, 52 people who signed up for this. We had 51 showing up or actually even more because I know, um, you know, I had a, a few friends also coming over here. So um, I think we have a really good grasp of who were here. Thank you, Robert. That sounds really easy. Robert Sandusky. Perfect. And can you tell us, Robert, where you're from? Just, just for fun. And Lori saying, um, you will keep doing this. Thank you so much, Lori. Guys, if you have a recommendation, if you want me to tackle something, let me know. Because really, my passion is dissecting what I think I can grasp. I dive into it. And I do a lot of things to just bring it back as something we can all understand with storytelling as well, with some real examples. Obviously, some C courses are a lot more scientific than I present over here but I would love to just continue providing some series. And if you have a recommendation, please send me an email. And thank you, Robert, for saying you are in Chicago, lovely Chicago. Um, luckily this year, Chicago happened before this whole pandemic in North America started to become big. And in March, we had to close everything. Um, thank you again, guys. I'm gonna leave you here. It's a little past five o'clock. You have been an amazing, amazing audience being on the other side, participating in the chat, listening, asking questions. I really enjoyed all of you for being here. Um, Echo Rhonda, yes, your CE will be sent to you via email. Thank you again. And again, my name is Claire. If you have questions, I'm always available via email. And I would love to understand what you want from me, okay? If you want next time, I want you to talk about bacteria. Well, we can do that as well, okay? Thank you, everybody. So we had Christina, we have Toronto, we have Barons. Um, obviously, we had Robert. I remember Diana, Amy, Megan. Anybody else? Kelly, Rochelle. Uh, we have T, I know, Katrin, Jacqueline, Carissa. We had so many of us over here today. Um, Doina, Carly, Erin, and thank you for all of you who really have participated a lot today. Megan, Lynn, Christine, um, Chrisen, um, and who else? Um, Amber, are you here? Melissa, Chris, <laughs> um, Kelly, Rachel, Debbie, uh, Nimisha, and again, everybody. So have a great day, all. Remember, social distancing is a real thing, okay? They didn't do it for fun. The CDC say so because our droplets can travel about six feet. Sometimes it's drop at three feet, but five feet, six feet, even 10 feet. Ooh, Erin, happy birthday, where are you? Wow, Erin, La France. Um, well, we are very honored to have you today. If we knew already, oh, I would have done something. But thank you everybody for sharing happy birthday to Erin. It is just my honor to have you today. I can't believe you're doing this on your birthday. All right, we had Elisa as well and um, Becca, Lali. So Debbie, again, there is no CE code. I have a note of everything here who participated. We had almost exactly the amount of people who were registered except for about one person. So um, everybody who has registered except for that one person will get their CE in the email um, very, very soon, within the next 24 hours. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. 
Oh, it was emailed already. So yeah, okay. So as soon as um, this finished, it was five o'clock, it was supposed to, um, and we had an assistant over here um, who was supervising all of that, just in case you guys were curious about how this was working. Um, I always have someone who is taking notes, who is taking attendance and all of that while we're doing the webinar. So that helps me just focus on the webinar. That's what's happening every single time. All right. Thank you, guys. I'm going to leave you here. Have a wonderful day. And happy birthday again, Erin. Stay safe, stay sane, stay healthy. That's what Alyssa is saying. Um, I'm going to say also uh, stay hydrated. Um, humidity, they also say help for the virus. Um, try to get some sunlight somehow. Try to exercise. Uh, what else is there? Uh, stay in good spirit, okay? All right. Bye.